We're going to jump right into the debate. We are thankful to have you here as well as thankful to the speakers of whom I'm going to introduce. First, T Jump, who is the leader of the channel T Jump on YouTube as well as the Discord channel T Jump, and also introducing Kenny Bomer, who is from Houston, Texas, and has been a Muslim for over 30 years. He is the author of the book Consider Islam Disproving the Patriots of Propaganda. The second edition was just released on Amazon and the number one release in both genres of comparative religions and religious studies. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start by saying, As-salamu alaykum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, peace be upon everyone. I do bear witness there's no God other than Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his final servant and the seal of all prophets. I'd like to thank the organizers of, the, of this uh, debate con 2022, the first one ever, and uh, they've been very accommodating, been very uh, gracious host, and they've made it pleasant every step of the way. We had a few technical issues with the, with the audio, but that's, that's just how it goes. That's the audio. We, we uh, can't do anything about that. But I also want to say thank you to TJ for the re world-renowned TJ, the, the world-renowned T-Jump. Uh, I did want to get, gift him a copy of the translation of the Clear Quran and a copy of my book, Consider Islam Disproving the Patriots of Propaganda. Thank you. With that being said, I will start my time here. And I'd like to say that Islam is much more than a religion. It's a complete and comprehensive way of life with a universal message. And if followed properly, it's a system of belief that is guaranteed to bring success to the individual and society alike as it guides people to be decent and just contributing members of society. And one who follows this way of life is a, is a Muslim, meaning one who submits willingly. And it's a Muslim's duty to act in defense of all that is right and to oppose all that is wrong. Allah says in the Quran to, that the good deed and the evil deed cannot be equal, so repel evil with that which is better, so that he between whom and you there is enmity will become as the closest of friends. So based on the guidance from Allah in the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that if someone among you sees wrong being committed, that he must, he must write it with his hand through deed and action, through conduct, by somehow intervening, Right? And if he cannot do that, then he must do it with his tongue by speaking up or calling for help or speaking out against the injustice. And if he cannot do that, then he should do it by his gaze through a, a look of disapproval. And if he cannot do that, then he should do it with his heart, meaning that we turn to Allah in prayer about the situation. Some things in life only Allah can change. Islam guides and shapes people in collective morality for all in society who have a willingness to follow it. No one can be forced. Collective morality is expressed in the Quran in such terms as equality, justice, fairness, brotherhood, mercy, compassion, solidarity, and freedom of choice. It encourages the individual to be, be part, you know, active participants in society in the process of, the process of establishing moral objectives through all of society and not just within a chosen group. It starts with the individual who then influences his group, who then influences society as a whole. Islam teaches and encourages every person to play an active role in the process because doing so will bring about success in this life and even greater reward in the hereafter. Each member of society in Islam is therefore encouraged to take care of all members of society by sacrificing of one's time and one's resources and to take initiative according to his or her ability so that others are able to overcome their own burdens. Allah says in the Quran, by no means shall you attain righteousness unless you have freely chosen uh, that which you love and given what you have loved, what you love. And whatever you give of truth, Allah knows it well. So above all, Islam seeks to inculcate within every Muslim the need to seek justice and to apply it to himself as well as to others. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by following the guidance of Allah, is recognized by the U.S. Supreme Court, many people don't know this, as one of the history's greatest, uh, 18 greatest lawgivers. But the Islamophobes, in the world of Islamophobia, they don't know that because the media seldom mentions anything good about Islam. And if they do know about it, then they quickly move past it because all they've been told is that Islam is, you know, some, is radicalizes people, makes them commit acts of terrorism. It's not true. Allah says in the Quran, Indeed, Allah commands you to render trust to whom they are, are due, and when you judge between people, to judge with justice. Excellent is that which Allah instructs you indeed, and Allah is forever hearing and knowing and seeing. So, as in Western codes of, of morality... Islam is a moral system of laws referred to as Sharia. And in the world of Islamophobia, once again, people have been convinced that Muslims are working behind the scenes to force this infamous Sharia law on people. That's not true. 
And however, Sharia law is, is, is to be followed by Muslims themselves. It has nothing to do with non-Muslims. Non-Muslims have nothing to fear regarding Sharia. It, Sharia is for the Muslims. And again, Sharia are, are God-given laws that include the requirement for Muslims to follow the laws of the land as long as those laws don't cause someone to commit some type of evil. Islam gives people guidance for life, but also the freedom to choose whether or not to follow that guidance. Allah makes it clear in the Quran by saying, let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth has been made clear from falsehood, and whoever embraces that truth has grabbed hold of a trustworthy handhold that will never break. That verse is saying that people have the freedom of choice to follow or not follow the guidance of Islam. It's their choice. Just like someone has the choice whether or not to follow the laws of the land. However, failure to follow the guidance will eventually bring about failure for both the individual and mankind alike. And that is the test of which Islam provides the solution. It's part of the world's greatest questions that you know, the, every human being eventually asks themselves. Why are we here? What's this life all about? And unlike any other system of belief, Islam gives a great comprehensive answer for it. Allah says in the Quran, it was for a true purpose and specific term that we created heaven and the earth and everything in between. Yet those who deny the truth ignore the warning that they have been given. Allah says in another verse that recall when your Lord brought forth from the loins of the children of Adam their descendants and had them testify regarding themselves when he asked them, am I not your Lord? And they replied, yes, you are. Indeed, we, we testify to that. Then Allah can, uh, cautioned them by saying, now you have no right to say on the day of judgment that you were not aware. So this test is to distinguish between those who are humble and grateful from those who are arrogant because they see themselves as self-sufficient. And if we, if we did not have a purpose, then we would be no more significant than animals that just react on instinct without any conscience, only living and dying. Allah says in the Quran, Be sure we will test you through fear and hunger and the loss of lives and property and the fruits of your labor. But we give glad tidings and hope to those who persevere and who say when affected with a calamity, inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun. From Allah we come and to Allah we will return. This gives people hope in something that you know, makes this life worth you know, all the struggle that we go through in this life. So the purpose of the test is to give glory to our creator instead of arrogantly giving it, giving it to ourselves as though we're self-sufficient. Especially since we all know, you know our own weaknesses and insecurities and the flaws that we have. Therefore, Islam gives people purpose and hope to, you know, people in the midst of their own trials, helping them to, to keep pushing forward and to do right instead of engaging in things that are detrimental to self and thereby detrimental to society. Most people on the planet either fail to follow or totally reject guidance. Instead, they engulf themselves in seeking pleasures of the world while clinging, on to, you know, clinging to mostly self-gratifying, individualized, subjective views about morality. But that way of life eventually breaks down because... The people who, who have no universal moral compass with which to guide the masses uh, towards good, how, you know, it, it creates a problem eventually. However, the prayer in Islam is the constant and universal plea, plea, uh, plea that we, we pray five times a day, asking our Creator to guide us to the straight path, the path that is best for both the individual and society alike. Islam encourages people to make constant effort as individuals and as a community uh, who encourage and influence one another to do good. Allah says in the Quran, compete with one another as if in a race, doing good righteous deeds. So Islam dissolves away all the dangerous views of moral relativism and the, to each his own mentality. It incorporates all of the commonly accepted moral values of, of, in laws of society that are actually God-given instincts about what's wrong and right and teaches humanity to be constant and proactive in following these moral codes. Islam widens the scope either, even further by helping society to be constant, you know, constantly mindful of our domestic associations, civic conduct, our activities in political, economic, legal, educational, private, and social realms. It covers life in the home and in society abroad, from the dining room table to the battlefield, from the cradle to the grave. Islam demands that morality be at the forefront of every action and ensures that the affairs of life are regulated by moral norms instead of being dominated by selfish uh, desires and petty interests that are nothing more than a system of self-aggrandized self-gratification. Islam answers the most basic and fundamental questions to the most complex and provides a solution for how to deal with every problem that we face in society. By example, this pandemic. It's recorded in the saying of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he said, if you hear of a plague in a land, do not enter it. And if it breaks out in the land where you, where you live, do not leave. 
And he said another hadith that he said, do not quarantine the healthy with the infected. Now, these comments were made over 1,400 years ago before modern technology could tell us how exactly how diseases spread. And, but, however, it'd be uh, futile to make blanketed statements by claiming everyone knows about this, everyone knows that. Because here we are two years after the pandemic, and people are trying to travel on airplanes but are complaining about wearing their masks, and other people are refusing to get vaccinated. And so... Also, signs, you know, reminding people to wash their hands are everywhere. Meanwhile, as Muslims, we cleanse ourselves no less than five times a day before each and every prayer. And many of us are, are strong, liberated Muslim women readily choose to cover themselves in modesty by wearing the hijab and sometimes wearing the veil. They're not forced to do this, contrary to popular belief. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that cleanliness is half of the faith. And that's based on Allah telling us in the Quran that truly Allah loves those who turn to him in repentance and loves those who purify themselves in all aspects. He also said in the Quran, uh, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that and we sent down in the Quran such things that have a healing and mercy for the, the believers. Another one of the world's great problems is poverty and homelessness. One of the five pillars of faith in Islam is zakat, spending of one's, one's own wealth in charity. The word zakat is mentioned 32 times in the Quran, and one simply cannot be a Muslim if they don't give in charity. Allah says in the Quran, this is the book of which there is no doubt, it, containing guidance for those who are mindful of Allah, and for those who believe in the unseen, and for those who spend out of what we have provided for them. Everything that we have in this life comes from our Creator. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there, thereby says, that charity wipes away sins. In another hadith, he says that every act of goodness is considered an act of charity, and that even sharing your smile with someone, being polite, is a form of charity. So according to a, an article titled, U.S. Muslims gave more to charity than other uh, Muslims, uh, other Americans, rather, in 2020, published uh, November 5th, 2021, they stated in that article that Muslims gave more to charity in 2020 than non-Muslims, and Muslims are more likely to volunteer. And in their study, they said that only 1.1% of all Americans are Muslims, and their average income is lower than that of non-Muslims. But they explained in their 2021 Muslim American Giving Report that despite making up only 1.1% of the nation's population, that Muslims donated, uh, Muslim donations uh, uh, were as, uh, as a highly diverse and quickly growing minority contributed to an estimated 4.3 billion in total donations to mostly non-religious causes over the course of that year, exceeding all other groups, religious and non-religious alike. They said in that, uh, in that article that, and I quote, they said, we believe our findings are significant not only because this is the first time that we can see the size and scope of giving by this small and highly diverse community, but also because U.S. Muslims face a great deal of discrimination. Another poll in the, in the U.K., they, they said that, uh, that Muslims gave more to charity ahead of Christians, Jews, and atheists. And a poll um, by Define Financial in 2021 said that, uh, that Jews and Muslims give more to public uh, society benefit organizations involved in civil rights and social inequalities than Christian and non-Christian neighbors. And of course, that encompasses every group. Another problem in the world is that the world has faced is war. Nearly 32 years ago, J. A. Chanton, in his book, Militant Islam, said, and I quote, The image of Muslim armies con converting people as they advanced has sank so deeply into the Western mind that no amount of repetition of the truth is likely to dis dislodge it. So contrary to Islamophobic belief, Islam never, was never spread through war, but instead it spread because of the wars waged against Islam. And we're still seeing that happen today. Islam is still the fastest growing religion in every country in the world, with most reverts being women. Islam demands that Muslims only fight in defense of self and, and, and others in society, everyone standing up against all injustice. And if war is necessary, which sometimes it is, that it must be conducted justly and only uh, um, until aggression from the, enemy, from the enemy stops or from the other side stops. After the Reformation, uh, secular versions of the, the just war theory were prominent, and just war is con contrasted with holy war, and because of the Christian crusades, uh, they were considered by many Christians to be holy wars. It's often assumed that jihad is the Islamic equivalent, however, that's anything but the truth. Based on Allah's guidance in the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, developed eight rules of engagement in Islam, which state that killing non-combatants is not allowed. I'm going to repeat, killing non-combatants is not allowed. 
The eight rule of, uh, rules of engagement in Islam prohibit the killing and destruction of women, children, the elderly, non-combatants, rel religious leaders, animals, religious buildings, trees, and crops. All the rules of war are based on verses of the Quran in which Allah says, by example, fight in the cause of Allah against those who first fight you and run, run them out of places that they have first run you out of. But if at any time they stop their aggression towards you, you stop your aggression so that you don't become those who oppress. Allah says in another verse of the Quran that Allah does not prohibit you from showing kindness and being just to those who do not fight you, nor who have driven you out of your homes. Indeed, Allah loves those who are just. Another one of the world's problems, please allow me to get a drink of water in one second. Excuse me, alhamdulillah. Another one of the great problems of the world is uh, this issue of oppression and injustice and inequality. In his final sermon, I'm not going to go through the entire sermon. I'm going to touch on some key points of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the last sermon before he, he died. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, O people, it is, it is true that you have certain rights over, in regards to your women, but they also have certain rights over you. Do treat your women well and be kind to them, for they are your just partners and committed helpers. All of mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superiority over an Arab, and an Arab has no superiority over an, a non-Arab. A white has no superiority over a black, nor does a black have any superior, superiority over a white. None have superiority of the, over the other except through good action and piety. And he ends by saying, do not therefore do injustice to yourselves. It's based on what Allah tells us in the Quran. He says, to each of you we have prescribed a law and a way of life. And had Allah so willed, he would have made you all of one community. But his will was to test you in what he has given each community. And so he says... So compete with one another in, in doing good. And to Allah will, all, will you all return. And then he will inform you over the things in which you used to differ. Many of those who attempt to villainize Islam are unaware of the fact that the Harvard Law School, one of the most prestigious institutions in the, of its kind in the world, has posted a verse of the Holy Quran at the entrance of its faculty library describing the verse as one of the greatest expressions of, of justice in history. The verse comes from Surah Anisa, the, ch the chapter about women, verse 135, and it's been posted at a wall of the faculty's uh, main entrance dedicated to, to the best phrases in articulating justice. And they say, uh, that verse says rather, it says, O you who have believed, be patiently standing firm in justice as witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or your parents or your relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. So follow not your personal inclinations, lest you be unjust. And if you distort uh, your, your testimony by lying or refuse to give it, then be aware that indeed Allah is all aware of what you do and he's well acquainted. One of the, I'm going to close with uh, uh, addressing one of the greatest problems in this world, and that's the uh, use of drugs and alcohol. The Pew Research Center said in the United States and many other countries that the relig religiously active people are less likely to drink alcohol than those who are not as religious. And they say, and I quote, that may not be a surprise because holy texts from the Christian New Testament to the Quran to the Hindu text warn against the dangers of excessive drinking and other potentially harmful, harmful vices. But they, uh, but they say, uh, despite those teachings, the relationship between religion and alcohol consumption remains a nuanced one. And not all U.S. religious groups eschew alcohol to the same degree. They state that alcohol remains a prominent part of Christian religion, from the gospel accounts of Jesus turning water into wine, peace be upon him, uh, to the present-day European monks who support themselves by brewing beer, to the use of wine in some contemporary communion services. Their report also said that there's a higher likelihood of drinking among the rel religiously unaffiliated and that less than 1% of atheists said alcohol is, morally, is not morally wrong. They, they didn't agree that it was morally wrong. So the, they also stated in that article that they did not uh, survey Muslims because our faith teaches us that intoxicants of all kind are forbidden and deemed harmful. So people who have looked into Islam unbiasedly uh, see the benefit of it. And that's why, again, as I mentioned, that Islam is the fastest growing religion in every country in the world. Modern technology has made it possible for people to be, to be exposed to the truth of Islam, even despite the propaganda and the negative portrayal of Muslims in the media. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Alhamdulillah, the message of Islam will enter every home as a sign before the Day of Judgment. Allah says in the Quran, man plans and Allah plans, and Allah is the best of planners. 
In their most recent study, the Pew Research Center said that Islam will nearly equal Christianity in the number of followers by 2050 before eclipsing it at around 2070 if current trends continue. And that's because people do see Islam as a solution. And despite the propaganda, it's, it's very prominent in this world. I try to encourage people when I talk to people about Islam to be readers and not repeaters by repeating the same rhetoric over and over and over again. It's hate speech. It's, it causes division. You find a Muslim that is attacking someone uh, you know, be, because of their re religion, call me because I want to talk to that Muslim, if he's a Muslim at all, because that goes against the grain of Islam. It's not allowed. Islam it demands, it demand, it demands it's a great, our great obligation to stand up against injustice, to speak out no matter who's, who, who the oppressor is, be they Muslim, non, it doesn't matter who they are. It's the Muslim's responsibility to speak out against injustice. So I invite everyone, again, to be readers instead of repeaters. Please don't listen to the propaganda because they don't stop. And ask you, and I invite you, to consider Islam for what it is instead of rejecting it for what it is not. And I'll leave you by saying, As-salamu alaykum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Kenny, for your opening statement. And we are now going to hand it up to T-Jump for his up to 20 minute opening statement. T-Jump, the floor is all yours. Thank you, James, Amy, and Kenny Boomer for joining us today. I appreciate the opportunity to hold this debate, and thank you, everyone in the audience, for being here. Really appreciate you guys. Uh, the question today is, what is the solution to humanity, Islam or atheism? Uh, in answering this question, I think the best way to do that is to look at how these ideologies influence and inspire the communities to which adopt them. And we can look at these through a number of statistical means. Um, there is a ton of data on these different topics and the correlations between religious belief, relig religiosity, and poverty, and education level, IQ level, um, technological advancement. It's pretty much any statistic you can name, we have data on it. Um, if you'd like to know the religious level and education level or any of these stats for any given state or country, you can just look at the Pew Forums Religious Landscape Survey. It's all there. And you can go ahead and check which of the various states and countries have a different level of religiosity and how often people go to church, um, self-acclaimed religion. And you can check in the corresponding levels of poverty and education and obesity, uh, violent crime rates, diabetes rates, child abuse rates, educational attainment levels, income levels, unemployment rates, uh, sexually transmitted disease, teen pregnancy, you name it, it's on there. We got data on all of this. So we can literally just go down the list and test, is this ideology one that inspires a better way to live? And resoundingly, the answer is, if the country is more secular, it does better in every one of these statistics. The more religious the country is, the worse off it is in every single one of these criteria. You name it, every single sociological measure of well-being, you are more likely to find secular states with the lowest levels of faith in God and the lowest rates of church attendance faring far better in each one of these criteria. And if you look at the states with the highest levels of faith in God and rates of church attendance, they have the worst in each one of these statistics, both locally in the United States and globally across the world. This statistic even holds if you include the worst of all of these secular nations, China, Russia, North Korea, even though North Korea is comparable to many of the worst countries in the world, which are also Islamic in many cases, the, the average of all the secular nations far outweighs the average of the Muslim nations. So if Islam really was the solution to humanity, you would expect the Muslim countries would be doing better than the secular countries, which is the exact opposite of what we're seeing. Um, one of the biggest problems in the Islamic nations is Islam. Islam is one of the biggest problems because its focus on religious beliefs in education trumps education of scientific beliefs. And since they focus so heavily on religious texts and teaching their kids the religious doctrines rather than the scientific doctrines, 
they get far less of a education that gears them towards political change, scientific advancement, and benefiting humanity overall. And we can see this in many respects, specifically in women who are treated as second-class citizens, as they are not even given the same level of education as the men are, they aren't given the opportunity to te teach their kids as much science or inspire them to be as many scientists, which is why we see uh, Islam being so far behind technologically and scientifically, why Islam is only 0.8% uh, of all Nobel Prizes, whereas atheism is 10% of Nobel Prizes. Christianity is 65%, Judaism is 25%. We can test that each of these ideologies do far better as a solution to mankind than Islam does. So I'm not sure why we should consider Islam to be the solution when it can't even come on par to these other main ideologies in the world. If we look at scientific belief, the amount of scientists who believe in a god is, from this poll, about 72% personal disbelief in a god, and about 7% believe in a god of the highest scientists in the world. It's a pretty staggering number. Just given general populace compared to average scientists, about 80% of the general populace believe in god, about 33% of scientists believe in a god. Um, from this, we can say that if you don't believe in a god, you're more likely to have a more scientifically minded uh, set of beliefs that makes you more likely to make a difference in the world, which is why we see such a disparity in Nobel Prizes between religious and non-religious. From the Sage Journal, are Muslim countries more prone to violence? Muslim countries are over overrepresented among countries with the high levels of overall forms of internal violence, including non-state conflict, one-sided violence, highly repressive human rights policies, and countries that practice capital punishment. Uh, kidnappings are 50 six percent higher than the average, murders are three times higher than the average. If we look at human rights and rule of law in all countries, um, 2021, 80 percent of the worst countries are Muslim countries. Half of the world's population for prisoners of blasphemy are in Pakistan. Like if we're just looking at these statistics, we can just go down for days and days, all of these different statistics show that the Muslim countries do worse for humanity than the secular countries, or the Jewish countries, or the Christian countries. They all do better in all of these regards, and so if we're looking for the solution to humanity, we would probably go for one that does better off for the people in the country. Now one of the main arguments here is the no true Scotsman. Well maybe those aren't real Muslims. Maybe the real Muslims wouldn't do those kinds of things. And maybe so. I can't, I can't say who are the real Muslims and who aren't, but I can say that this ideology of Islam has an effect on people at some proportional rate of the true Muslims and some proportional rate of the not true Muslims. And overall, that effect is far less than the proportional rate of the true atheists or the true Christians or the true Jews. Those ideologies as a whole tend to inspire more people to do better in that society than Islam does. And if we're looking for a solution to humanity, it's better to go with the one that disproportionately has a positive impact on the society. Even if Kinney is right and Islam is the true perfect thing, that if the very small percent of people who really followed it live perfect lives, because it's such a small percent of the society, it doesn't have a significant enough of an impact on a whole society to be considered a really the best solution. The best solution is one that affects the most people and provides the best quality of life for the most people, not just the few minority who might actually choose to follow it. Uh, other problems in Islam. Um, Gender-based violence. There's more gender-based violence in Islam than pretty much any other religion. Uh, domestic violence, honor killings, female genital mutilation, which is also a problem here for male genital mutilation. Uh, marital rape is higher in Muslim countries than non-Muslim countries, the lowest being in secular nations. Uh, in conclusion, Islam, if Islam is a solution for humanity, then it should be able to solve the problems in Islamic countries. And if it can't do that, then it isn't really a contender to say that it's a solution for all humanity in non-Muslim countries. Until Islam can live up to the standards of all the other countries that we see in secular nations and Christian nations and Jewish nations, then it's not really a serious contender for the solution of humanity. And I will conclude there. Thank you so much, Tom, for your opening statement. And with that, we're going to hand it right back over to Kenny for his up to eight minute rebuttal. The floor is all yours. Okay. Please let me get my, my stopwatch back up here for a second. And thank you for that, uh, TJ. All right. So uh, according to the Huffington, Huffington Post, 12 of the last Nobel Peace Prize winners are Muslim. And that is 42%. Uh, 12 out of the last, what is, what, what is it? Bear with me one second. Yeah, tw 
12, yeah, 12, just 12 of the last, according to Huffington, Huffington Post, 12 of the last Nobel Peace Prize winners were Muslims. And in regards to, you know, we're not, we're not talking about, uh, um, we're, we're looking for solutions to these problems. So we're not here to discuss the failures of humanity. We're not here to discuss failures of people. We're talking about the doctrine itself. What does Islam say? not what people do. Okay, so if, if he did make a, uh, in regards to saying who the true Muslims are, the true Muslims are referred to as the mu'min, the true believers. Allah says in the Quran, in al-muslimina al-muslimati wal mu'minina al-mu'minati, meaning the Muslim men, the Muslim women, the believing men and the believing women, making a clear distinction between the true believers, remember the mu'min are the true believers, and making a clear distinction between those who call themselves Muslim, maybe they're born into Muslim families and so forth, or they're Muslim by, by name, and they, you know, they may associate with the, the community, but they don't live according to what Islam teaches. So we're not here to discuss the failures of mankind. We're here to discuss what does the, the, the religion, what does the, the doctrine teach? And during the course of, of TJ's opening, uh, I appreciate all of it, but I didn't hear anything that, is, that atheism provided as a solution. So again, we're here to discuss what does the creed itself bring as, as, as guidance, a moral guidance to all people. It starts with the individual and then goes on to other people. Yes, there's Muslim countries in the world that have problems, but guess what? We have a lot of problems here in the United States. As a matter of fact, I have statistics here. I can bring them up in regards to the, the uh, let me go ahead and grab it real quick, because the, the, the drug and alcohol use, by example, here in the United States is so prominent. I mean, it's, it's something that, uh, that people are just, you know, are, you know are consuming things that are so detrimental to, to them that they, uh, it's, it's a huge problem. And it opens the doors to, to other problems, other issues. So bear, bear with me one second as I go to this figure here, because it's quite disturbing. And uh, so again, in regards to women, now, the verse that I just mentioned, and there's many verses similar to this, in al-Muslimina al-Muslimati al-Mu'minina al-Mu'minati, Allah's, Allah's mentioning the men and the women collectively to establish a, when you study the tafsir, when you study the interpretation of what these verses are talking about, it's... It's, Allah is mentioning these verses to, to establish the equality between men and women. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he taught his companions that the best among you are those who are best to their women. In the Islamophobic world now, they're going to convince you that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was a, you know, a, a warmonger and he was a pedophile and he was all these things that stuck for Allah. No, he was not. But that's the ongoing narrative that's, that's repeated over and over and over again. But think about it. The truth is the truth even if no one believes it. And a lie is a lie even if everyone believes it. A lie often repeated eventually becomes that, that, that what's accepted. You know, it becomes accepted as the truth. Even the liar himself begins to tell the lie so often that he has convinced himself that the lie that he's telling is the truth. And so, I, you know, depending where, where uh, T-Jump got these, these figures from... Uh, I don't, I'm not surprised by, uh, by, by the figures, and I, I'll tell you why, because uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to deny any reality of them, but also we have to consider the source where you got it from. We live in a world where Islamophobia is running rampant, and that's the truth of the matter. It's, it's something that, that we can't hide from. And so, we're, again, we're looking for solutions. What does, what does atheism have to, to provide? What does it have to provide? According to Sean Breen with the Atheist Republic, he says, and I quote, this is his words. He says, atheism contains no demands nor consensus on purpose, nor does it enforce any universal meaning. There's no atheistic ex existential reason for all of human existence. So if atheism can't provide you know, a solution for the, the basic question about why we're we here in life and why, why this life exists, then how can it provide universal guidance to people? You know, uh, it, you know, but, but contrast to what, to what Allah says in the Quran, 
that it's not righteousness that you turn your faces toward the east and the west, but, it, but what's righteous is that you believe in Allah in the last day and the angels and the book and the messengers and give of your wealth to relatives and orphans and travelers and beggars for those who ask and for those who, who ransom slaves and to establish regular prayers and practice regular charity and to f- fulfill the contracts that you have made and to be firm and patient in times of suffering and adversity through all periods of panic. These are the people of truth, the men, the true believers, the God-fearing. So, yes, people fail. People in the, in the United States are failing. People in Mexico, they're failing. In Canada, they're failing. All over the world, people are failing. But what doctrine is guiding people to the truth? Why is it, ask yourself, if Islam is that bad, why is it, how could it be that Islam is the fastest growing religion in every country in the world? That's a fact. It will surpass Christianity. It will. And some people use the excuse, well, that's just the, the Muslim birth rates are out of control. On the contrary, think about this. If you're a God-fearing person, if you believe in a creator, and I, believe, I realize some people here may not, but nevertheless, if you believe in a creator, then if you believe everything happens by the will of that creator, then that, that creator, if it was in fact the birth rates that did it, which is not it's a cop-out, but if it was in fact the birth rates that did it, then it would have been the creator himself that caused those births to happen. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi I mean, so it's still the will of Allah that causes that to happen. Still, it causes what the prophet, peace be upon him, said, saying, Islam will enter every household before the day of judgment as a sign before the day of judgment. Now, people may not accept Islam, but what's happened is, and, and thank you to you know, the organi- uh, organizers of this debate, by example, because, you know, and all the people are out doing da'wah and all the, the discussions about Islam, that it is going into people's home, whether people reject it or not. But what the prophet, peace be upon him, said is being fulfilled in the, in the age of modern technology. People are running to Islam. They're not running from it. They're running to it. Fastest growing religion in the world that is providing solutions. Once again, that's the topic of the debate. What's the solution for society? I haven't heard anything, unfortunately, I haven't heard anything that atheism gives to provide answers to these problems. Islam has a solution. Intoxicants aren't allowed. You know, I'll repeat, intoxicants aren't allowed. You can't do it. You can't be a Muslim and consume alcohol and, and intoxicants. You just can't do it. You can't call yourself a mu'min. You might call yourself a Muslim, but you're not of the true believers because the true believer doesn't do that. You understand? And so think about the, the people who, um, in, in my closing, the people who are suffering th- from alcoholism and drug abuse and, you know, people crackheads and, all, you know, all these things that we see in society that pr- creates one problem after another, destroying families and, and tearing down the individual physically, mentally, emotionally. Islam says, don't do this. You know what it says? It says there's some benefit in alcohol for the people, but the detriment is far worse. So stay away from it because it's from Satan. It's going to cause you problems eventually. It might make you feel good for a time. It might open you up and, you know, I'm happy-go-lucky. It might take away your burdens and your pains and your experience in life for a short period of time. But those problems still remain. You're only trying to blanket them and hide them, and you can't run from them. And again, I, I invite you to accept Islam and to uh, realize that we're looking for solutions in this debate, inshallah. So very much, Kenny. And with that, we're handing it right back to T. Jump for his eight-minute rebuttal. Piece of paper, I can Thanks. Thank you. All right. So to jump right in. So Kenny mentioned that there are problems in the U.S. too. Oh no, it's a two quo quay fallacy. The fact that there are some problems in the US and that we don't have like perfect solutions to everything doesn't mean that that is, it's equally as bad. I would not count alcoholism at the same level as female genital mutilation or honor killings. Um, I feel the problems in the Islamic community are far worse than the problems in the secular communities. For example, uh, can you mention homelessness? Uh, there are, just Google it, 83,000 homeless children in Saudi Arabia. There are zero homeless people in Japan, one of the most secular nations in the world. Only country with no homelessness is a secular country, Japan. So if we're going based off homelessness, secular countries win. Um, He mentioned that Islam is the fastest growing religion. Even if that's true, that doesn't make it good. I don't care about the number of people who adhere to it. I care about the quality of the lives that the ideology promotes. So I don't really think that bringing the number of people who happen to go to a religion as a qualification for which is the solution to humanity is really a great criterion here. 
Um, he mentioned that Islam solves moral relativism. Well, this isn't actually a problem. Most people believe in moral objectivism even without religion. If we just look at the Pew Surveys paper, the largest poll of philo professional philosophers, about 70% believe in moral realism, <coughs> even though only about 15 to 20 are religious. So even though most of them are secular, they also believe in objective morality. You don't need a religion to believe in objective morality. So it's not really a problem that needs solving. Um, Kenny mentioned that no one's actually forced to wear a hijab. Well, he should definitely tell this to all the women in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan who will be honor killed if they don't do it. I, I don't know that they know this. Um, he mentioned poverty. Uh, poverty levels in Islamic countries is some of the worst with some of the most people who live on under a dollar a day. So I don't know how, even if maybe somewhere in the Quran there are solutions to these problems, no one in the Islamic communities are actually using those solutions to solve the problems. I feel like that's kind of a issue here when we're trying to say what is the better ideology. Uh, Kenny mentioned that it's not about the, the, what the people do, it's about what the doctrines say. Well, I totally disagree here. I don't care if your doctrine has the ultimate solution to everything, if nobody actually listens to it, then it's not a solution. For it to be a solution, you need to inspire the people to actually act on those solutions to make people's lives better. Just saying it has the solution but no one listens to it isn't really a solution at all. Um, he mentioned the Nobel Peace Prizes. Yes, most Nobel Peace Prizes are um, taken by Muslims because most of the wars and conflicts are in Muslim countries. That, that makes perfect sense. That isn't, an that isn't evidence for his case. That's evidence against it. Um, he said atheism does not provide a solution to these problems. I mean, I didn't offer a solution because you don't need to offer a solution. What you need is to offer statistics. Even if the ideology says just potatoes, everyone worship potatoes, and literally nothing else. If it inspires more people to act in such a way that they have better lives, then whether or not the potatoes doctrine actually offers answers doesn't matter because it's making people's lives better. So whether or not the book claims to have answers or says it has answers isn't really important here. What matters is, is which inspires people to live better lives. Um, secondly, atheism does offer answers to all these questions. That's why we have universal health care and the NHS and all the different secular nations that work together in order to solve homelessness and poverty and why there's no homelessness in Japan. Secular nations do have solutions that actually work and inspire people to solve these problems in those countries, which is why we don't need to say, here is the ultimate solution in paragraph six of the Atheist Holy Book. We can just say, look at our actions. We have less of these problems in our countries. We do have solutions and they work. We don't need some kind of super mind to tell us what to do. We're actually making the difference ourselves. Um, Secondly, uh, in, Kenny mentioned alcohol and drugs. Less alcohol and drugs in Muslim countries. Totally agree, this isn't a good thing. Uh, just to read Reuters, in moderation, alcohol and drug consumption has been linked to improved quality of life and lower risk of health problems like heart disease and certain cancers in some previous research, leading doctors to advise some patients to imbibe occasional as of a part of healthy diet, researchers know from the CMAG. You, alcohol isn't bad, drugs aren't bad. There's nothing wrong with them. They're totally good. They're better for people. They improve people's lives, lots of people's lives all over the world. Banning it outright because some people are alcoholics is a bad idea. You're going to decrease the freedom of everyone because some people overuse and overindulge. This is not a good thing. This is a bad thing. You're taking away people's freedoms and taking away people's happiness and joy just because some people do bad stuff. This is not a good doctrine. This is a bad doctrine that shows why we should not adopt Islam. We should prefer the ones that allow you to take alcohol and drugs in moderation because that improves people's quality of lives and taking that away will decrease people's quality of lives. Um, Kenny mentioned that there's no war, no spreading by the sword in Islam. Um, Google and all of the different historical sites and Yale disagree. Uh, early Muslim conquests, also referred to as Arab conquests, or the early Islamic conquests, began with the Islamic prophet Muhammad in the seventh century. He established a new unified polity that the Arab Peninsula, under which the subsequent Rashidun and Umayyad Muhad caliphates saw a century of rapid expansion through conquest. Yes, there were lots of conquests by the sword in Islam. This is a thing. Just calling them no true Scots, but they're not real conquests, or they're not done just to spread Islam. Yeah, Islam used the sword cherry-picking reasons here doesn't make it any less violent or murderous. So yes, yes, there were many of those. Um, charity. He mentioned charity, that there's more charity in Islamic nations, Islamic communities. 
I believe the charity in Christian is, is actually the highest, but that doesn't make a difference here because the effect is the lowest. The quality of life, the life expectancy in these countries is the lowest. Even if it has the most charity, it has the least actually effect on the quality of life of the people. What has the most effect is the NHS, the single-payer healthcare systems. The healthcare systems of the secular nations do far better to improve people's lives than any amount of charity in any country. So if we're talking about what's actually a solution to the problem of healthier, secular nations win hands down because we have healthcare. Um, inequality, so he mentioned inequality. Inequality is some of the biggest in Islamic countries. Just look at Saudi Arabia, where you have billionaires and billionaires and then homeless people, 83,000 homeless children on the streets. Inequality is some of the worst in the Muslim nations. Of course, America is worse. Granted, you got me on that one. America's bad. Um, other than that, he mentioned atheism has no source of answers to these questions. Yes, it does. I believe in objective morality. I am an atheist. I, in my model, I think we do have answers to these questions. I think there is a best of all possible worlds, the best way the world could be. One where there's, it's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing. There is your answer. That is the ultimate answer to perfect morality. You have an answer. Atheism does provide an answer. Um, I believe that's all I have for now, and I will conclude there. In fact, with that end of the rebuttal, that takes us to 15 minutes of open dialogue and conversation. It's all you guys. Okay, so I appreciate that, TJ. And um, I, but in the course of this, I, I did hear you say uh, towards the end that you tried to imply that atheism has an answer for these issues. But at the, you also said that drugs aren't bad, and that uh, you know you, that people should be allowed to use. Once again, in my opening statement, I, I stated that uh, that Islam demands that people have a right to choose. That's that's very important. And but but by saying that drugs aren't bad and people should be allowed to use. If we, if we look at the, the statistics on, on this, and I couldn't get to it earlier I, just because I couldn't find it on my, in my notes, but uh, I'm just going to read this. This is based on uh, drugabusestatistics.org, uh, and they state that um, uh, among Americans age 12 and older, 31.9 million are current illegal drug users, uh, and they have used within the last 30 days. 11.7% of Americans 12 and over use illegal drugs. 53 million, or 19.4% of the people 12 and over have used illegal drugs or misused prescription drugs within the last year. Uh, they state that if alcohol and tobacco are included, 165 million, or 60.2% uh, of, uh, of Americans age 12 and older are currently drug users, or abusers rather, and that they've also again used in the last 30 days. 139. 0.8 million Americans 12 and over drink alcohol. 14.8 million or 10.6 of them have an alcohol uh, use disorder. 58.8 million uh, use tobacco. 31.9, just a couple more lines here. 31.9 use illegal drugs. 8.1 million, which is 25.4% of illegal drug users have a drug disorder. And lastly, the, the 2 million people or 24.7% of those with drug disorders have an opioid, op opioid uh, disorder. This includes prescription painkillers and pain relievers as well as heroin. So my question to you is that, you know, it's, it's easy to say if you, haven't, if you haven't had anyone in your family or anyone that you know or if you just uh, haven't been exposed to someone who is, their life has uh, dissolved because of drug use or someone has died in a car accident and things of that nature, it's easy to say, oh, it's, it's not a problem. But what, 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 do you, what do you have to say to those people who have, you know, who have suffered that? Would you still tell those people that, you know, that people should, should be allowed to use? You know, would you tell someone who's lost their family member that? Yeah. I mean, the fact that some people abuse those things doesn't mean that everyone should lose the right. Raise your hand if you've illegally used drugs in America or drinking alcohol. Yeah, that's okay. How many of your lives are negatively affected by this? Keep your hands up. Okay. How many of them were more negatively affected than the positive effects you've gotten? A few hands. So everyone's hand was up. Everyone illegally used, pretty much. Yeah. And only a few of them had negative impacts. Well, Should we take the rights away from every single person in this room who had positive experiences with the, po with the illegal drug use well, who, just because of the few people who had a negative experience? Well, who's who's no. taking the right away? That's, that's what I'm asking you. So, again, well, in my well, opening right, statement, I've tried to stress the fact that in Islam, it's about freedom of choice. Allah says, let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth has been made clear from falsehood, 
And whoever embraces the truth is grab hold with trustworthy hand and never breaks. So what we're talking about here is, for one, it, no, Islam is not taking away people's freedom to, to choose to do what they're going to do. That's part of the test of life. That's why we're tested. Okay, and so let's, let's dissolve that idea. That's well, not what, true. But, but let, me, let me okay, interrupt there for a second. So the point here is that in your doctrine, it says all alcohol use should be banned. Now, from what I just showed, that would eliminate the happiness of all the people in here who got a positive impact from that. Whereas my ideology says this provides a positive benefit. As I read from the medical journal previously, moderate use can improve the quality of life for both drugs and alcohol. My ideology says this is a good thing for people. We should allow people to have this. Yes, some use it negatively, some have bad experiences, but many people have good experiences. So it seems like my ideology is more qualified to assess what's better for people here because it can allow for those who can gain many benefits from these. These do give benefits. These do improve quality of life, whereas your ideology doesn't allow for that. It doesn't see the positive benefits. So I appreciate that. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you remember. Um, I can go to the verse of the Quran, which it states that Allah says in the Quran in summary that, that, uh, that, that's, that alcohol and so forth has some benefit to man. You know, sometimes if you're sick, it make you feel better and things of that nature. It sometimes, sometimes takes away people's, people's worries and their stresses of life. But Allah says in the Quran, but the, but, the, the, uh, it, but the detriment of it is far worse. So avoid it because it's from, from Satan. So again, again, we're here looking for solutions to the society's problems. So if you don't, if you don't see drug and alcohol abuse and alcoholism and uh, drug abuse as a problem, then th there's the problem. Islam says to stay away from it. It's not, it, it, you're, you're, for one, you know, people have had a bad week and so they go and they get drunk on Friday, Saturday night thinking their, their problems are going away. No, they're not. So you're just masking that. So again, you know, uh, where's the solution to the overriding problem? Uh, is, is, it, uh, is it okay to go to the people at the drug centers that are, are trying to get off drugs and alcohol whose lives have been turned upside down because of their misuse and say, oh, no, it's not a problem. Go ahead and do it again. Of course not. Of course not. As, if we're, if we're going to look at things objectively uh, and be true to ourselves, we should be telling those people, look, uh, yeah, it's been bad for you. Don't, you, know, you probably need to stay away from it. Well, the thing is, you open the door a little bit and you know, it has the potential for opening f full bore, and there's the problem. So which is the better solution? To say, oh, it's okay, everyone use, use the alcohol, or to say, you're tested by whether or not you choose to not consume it or not. The Muslims, the, you can be assured there's Muslims somewhere that are consuming, right? There's, there's, they've got to be somewhere, but they're not following the doctrine. And, and you know, so again, it's not like Islam is, is placing a, a, a stamp and saying, you know, you, it's going to be our way or the highway. No, that's not true. It's, it's let there be no compulsion in religion. That's why we're tested. That's the beauty of it. So again, in summary, <laughs> I'm talking too much, but, but in summary, what would you tell the people at, at these, you know, trying to get off of the, the drugs or alcohol or whatever that has destroyed their lives or their families? What would you tell them? Would you tell them, go ahead and keep doing it? Or you tell them, you know, to stay away from it? No, no, I would tell them to stay away from it because they're misusing it, but I'd tell the people who positively gain impacts from it in life that they can keep doing it. Give me an example of the positive, in, the positive impacts that it has. I mean, weed, give me, what do you mean? Weed reduces stress and allows people to become better, healthier people. It reduces pain. Alcohol does the same thing. It can be relaxing. Many people have a glass of wine, which helps them take the edge off and improves their quality of life, helping them to work and function more. It can reduce the damage of heart disease. There are tons of these things. Okay. Like, as I just read from the medical journal, it is proven for a fact that moderate consumption of alcohol and drugs can benefit people's quality of life. This is a fact. And the fact that my ideology can recognize this scientific fact about the world and is not Islam is objectively wrong about this scientific fact shows that my ideology is more qualified to assess the solution to humanity. So I acknowledge, yes, there are people who with alcohol and drug problems, and we should give them the ability to like, go to treatment centers so they can be cured of those problems, but we should not take away the rights of everyone else who does not have those problems, which is the majority of people who do not have those problems, take away their freedoms to be able to use these things responsibly and take away their right to improve their own quality of life responsibly. It's, it's like the fact that many people drive badly and get into crashes, does that mean we should take away everyone's right to drive? Cool. Obviously not. 
The fact that some people have a problem does not mean we should restrict the rights or just have a blanket statement that all alcohol is bad. It's not. We know for a fact it's not all bad. The positives for many people do outweigh the negatives because they don't misuse it. It's only the people who misuse it who shouldn't have it, not everyone. Well, so uh, I think you was chasing the straw man a bit when you, you mentioned about the scientific facts. I haven't mentioned any scientific facts regarding Islam and what it states about alcoholism or drug intoxicants and so forth. I haven't said anything about that. Oh, I apologize. Yeah. You said um, the, it says in Islam that the, out, the negatives outweigh the positives or something well, like no, that. Well, no, I was saying the verse of the Quran say, yes, that the, that the, the, the problems that it causes are worse, so right. stay away from it. And that's the thing so, I'm saying is scientifically, provably false. Okay, well, so that's, that's not necessarily true. I, I, I don't know where you're getting those st statistics from, but let's, but let's look at this. Uh, collectively, and and not from the, the point of a, a view of someone who, um, again, has not had any type of family disruption or loss of life due to these problems. You know, p uh, people getting divorced because they cheated while they were drunk, or they f shot someone while they're drunk. I mean, these these are these are serious problems because it opens the door to other issues within life, within the community. So again, if do we're going to talk about what the majority, solution think, is, but, but what's think, the solution? What, what, what would be a better solution to eliminate it completely? To say, you know what, well, for, for all of humanity, for all of humanity, it would be better if we just stay away from that stuff. Because what happens when someone becomes, starts drinking, you know, using drugs and using alcohol, that their, their mind is altered and this is one of the reasons why Allah says don't come to the prayer in a state of intoxication because you don't know, you're not really, your mind is not in the right place. That's the reason it was actually in three steps uh, Islam was, was eventually eliminated. And, uh, but again, it's a, it's, it's a person's choice. That verse within itself is telling someone that you have the choice whether or not you're going to follow the guidance and do what's, what's better for yourself and for, for society, for the community, or if you're going to choose to do something that your mind is in the wrong place because, you know, you, you went and had a little wine, you go to get behind the wheel, and next thing you know, you're, you, you think you're doing fine, you feel, you feel fantastic, but you, your, your mind has been altered. Well, it seems you're making the same argument that I've already addressed. Like, the fact that a minority of people have problems does not mean we should ban the majority who don't. The majority of people who drink do not have alcohol problems. The majority of people who smoke weed are not addicted to weed. In fact, it's pretty hard to get addicted to weed. Very, very hard. So the majority of people do not have problems, and you listing a few people who do have problems is like saying, oh, look, a guy ate so much chocolate, he died from chocolate poisoning and got diabetes. Therefore, let's ban chocolate for everyone. This is a terrible idea. This is the kind of thing a bad ideology would do. Acknowledging the minority of issues and then trying to make a universal principle that applies to everyone as if that principle would be good for everyone is a factual mistake. Many oh. people's lives are, the majority of people's lives are benefited by alcohol and drugs, not detrimented by them. Do some people have problems? Yes. But if your ideology can't acknowledge the benefit it happens to have to billions of people's lives every day, then you, your ideology is a objectively worse ideology. I, I guess the question that comes to my mind is that if your mind is altered, then think about this, if your mind is altered, then you're saying inevitably that what, what makes you you is not, is not sufficient. And so you need something to make you feel better. And so your, your, own, your own comprehension is, is, is being uh, overrun by your choice to find, find some type of solution to make you feel better. Oh, I have no that, idea. That's, that's subjective, but, but you said, uh, you well, said wait, a, a I, few well, I'm people... Not, I'm not following what you're saying. There. Well, so okay, okay. Wait, 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 so... so what, your well, mind is altered by all kinds of things. Dopamine, oxytocin, all kinds of drugs in your brain that affect you without your control. And like stress okay, well, is a big one. Cortisol. Uh, I'm, glad you, I'm, I'm glad you brought so, that up. So, because, one sec, one sec. So okay. my point here is that these drugs can mitigate the things that are already affecting your brain that you have no control over, like stress or pain. Like medical marijuana is a thing and is very common and very good to have medical marijuana because it helps people cope with cancer when they're dying and suffering in pain 24-7. Yeah, this affects your brain and decreases okay. the pain like okay. all drugs do. That's kind of the point of drugs okay. is that they affect your body to mitigate other things. Okay, that I'm your glad you're saying doing. that. Thank you, because this, this uh, statement by, uh, according to Scientific American, says that, and this is their, what they're saying, and I quote, research suggests that religious brain, the religious, a, re a religious brain exhibits higher levels of dopamine 
a hormone associated with increased attention and motivation. End of quote. So it goes back to what I just said. If you're saying that you need to compromise your intellect, yourself, you need to compromise yourself to feel better and, and to cope with the things in life. Whereas the religious, religiously motivated people, religious people, by their, I'm not saying this is what they're saying, Scientific American, look it up, research also suggests that a religious brain exhibits high, higher levels of dopamine or hormone associated with increased attention and motivation. That's beautiful in my mind. Another one says that uh, the theists are more inclined than atheists to endorse moral values to promote group cohesion. These, they say these findings suggest that a widespread, the widespread idea that atheists are immoral may arise in part from their weak endorsement of moral values and, that promote group cohesion and their conscience-based, uh, conscience, conscience case-by-case moral judgment of actions. And that's what we're, that's what we're getting here because, you know, you, you said that uh, the, the, the rights of, of the, the majority shouldn't be overrun by because of the problems of a few, but 31.4 million uh, drug, you know, abusers in the world, that's, that's not a, that's a, a significant number. And what's, what's better to say, hey, society, let's stay away from that. Let's help one another, encourage one another. Let's find solutions outside of, tr of having to alter our minds. And so again, we're looking for solutions to the problem. Is drug, is, it wouldn't be labeled as dr drug abuse and alcoholism if it wasn't a problem. I mean, so it's, it's to imply that, that these problems aren't really problems because it doesn't affect me. Well, that's, that's subjective reasoning. That's, that's a, 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 you know, it don't, that, that, that relates to your, 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 uh, that's not what I said. your so, life experiences. So, so what I said was is that all drug use is not drug addiction. Not all people who have drugs no, are addicted that. to drugs. You said there's 34.1 million and there's several billion people who use drugs. Well, That's a very, very small percentage of a problem. So again, you keep conflating this problem with the minority and confusing that as evidence that your ideology is correct when it's objectively wrong. The majority of people who do drugs and alcohol do not have a negative consequence of life. They have the opposite. They have a positive consequence, which is what all of the research data shows. The reason it's illegal is because some people have a big problem with it, which can cause things like crashes. The vast majority of people do not have a problem. They have a benefit from these things, which has been proven scientifically in okay. numerous studies. Your position, your religion's position on this is objectively just wrong. Okay, let me ask you a question, TJ. Be honest. I mean, I'm, I, I expect you to be honest. I'm not saying you're... I expect you to be dishonest anyway. But uh, so I'm not, I don't know if you have children or not. But let's say, you know, s someone who's addicted to crack. Well, they, right, hold, right, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on one second. So a person who's addicted to crack, they think that, that you know, their objective is to go and get the crack and it, it makes them feel better. Okay. So my question to you would be, so we're not just talking about weed and we're not talking about, you know, just alcohol. We're talking about drug use, period, because we have stepping you know, there's, there's, it's a step process. You well, do you a little bit, you do more. But, addiction but, to drug use. Those are not the same thing. Okay, well, we're, the problem of alcoholism and drug abuse, that's what I'm talking about. Which is not the same as the use of it. Okay, well, so, so I realize same, that, same, that. But, but really, does it open? I, I agree with you that, yes, addiction is bad. We should give people treatment do, for addiction. Do you agree? Not everyone is addicted. Do the you, vast majority of people are not addicted. Okay. So treating the entire thing, the entire usage of drugs, and alcohol as if they were addicted is a false equivalent. Okay, well, hold on. So, do, do, But do you agree that the people who are addicted, they start it with that mentality of, of saying, okay, uh, you know, it just makes me feel better. And, I, you know, it's, it's not, not a problem. No. Don't you, you don't agree that... that no, that the gateway they, drug myth has been proven false. So, so it's is, not, the gateway drug is false. So, so, how, so how do you get from A to Z then? I mean, eventually you have you to start with A to get to Z. Huh? You take lots of drugs at the same time. Yeah, you time. take a lot of drugs, right? Yeah. And, and the drugs begin to take, have less effect on you, so you take a little more drugs. No. I take, take more cocaine so I can work harder, so no, I can no, no. So again, get, again, get more drugs. And, you know, that most the commercial people, from back in the day. Most people use it responsibly, and if you use it responsibly mm -hmm. in small doses, that really doesn't happen that So much. if you had children, I don't know if you do, no offense to your children, please don't take what I'm yes, saying. Yes, they can take drugs okay. responsibly. You, would you tell them, hey, uh, they said, hey, Dad, I want to use some crack. Would you say, oh, yeah, go ahead. If you take it responsibly, Just get your, get your yes. hit on that crack rock. I don't you think it, you would. Take it responsibly. Yes. So you would tell them to smoke crack responsibly. Yeah, there's actually okay. a number of. Well, we were, okay. There's a number of. And on that note, I want to thank both of our debaters for their open conversation, and we are going to give it to both them for their closing minute remarks, starting with you, Kenny. All right. All right. All right. 
All right, once again, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the organizers of, of this uh, DebateCon 2022. Um, it's been wonderful. It's been fantastic. We had a few hiccups with the audio earlier, but, you know, that's just how uh, things go in production and trying to put on an event like this. The organizers have been fantastic, and uh, uh, they've been very, very, uh, very gracious hosts, to say the least. And I look forward to having more of these events in the future, inshallah, God willing. I also want to thank TJ. Uh, uh, I've watched a number of his debates online. Um, he is uh, uh, very well uh, experienced uh, a debater, and so it was uh, enjoying. You know, I enjoyed very much uh, having this discussion. During the course of the discussion, you know, the, the topic of the debate was which is the solution for society, atheism or Islam? And I tried to establish, and uh, you know, regardless of the failures of mankind, people fail. People aren't perfect. They're going to they're going to do what they they're going to do. But what does the doctrine teach? What would, what would be better? And um, I try to demonstrate in, you know, just starting with the why, why does life exist? Why are we here? I tried to establish Islam has the solution and the answer for why we're actually tested. Why are we going through these things? You know, why do we have to deal with, you know, loss of life and property? And, you know, why, is, why do these hurricanes happen, these pandemic? What is this all about? It's all to draw our attention to the one who created us. A lot of ask a question in the Quran, making, ca causing people to think and to ponder and reflect, asking, does man not consider from that which he was created and what he's going to eventually return? But we pat ourselves on the back and we see ourselves as self-sufficient, like we're going to make it through this life with no problems. But in the, in the process of it, people are turning to drugs and alcohol and they're turning to sex and they're turning to you know, whatever else the world provides. Allah says in the Quran, this life is nothing more than play and amusement. So fear Allah. Fear your creator. Be mindful of your creator. And think, did you create yourself? Of course not. But I, I discussed the pandemic and the fact that people might say, oh, it's not a big deal. You're washing your hands and your face and cleaning yourself you know, before prayer five times a day. But look, we have signs everywhere saying, wash your hands. Adults being, need to be reminded to wash their hands. And, you know, this, it's a problem. Islam, automatically, we have, to, we have to cleanse ourselves before each and every prayer. We do this five times daily. There's the solution. Our Muslim women, you know, in some, in some, some Muslim countries, it's part of their culture that they, they, they dress in modesty. But let, let's make it clear. The Muslim woman is not forced by the doctrine itself. That's culturalism. The doctrine doesn't say that they have to cover their face and they have to, you know, it says to tell your women to cover their adornments, their body parts, to live, you know, cover themselves in modesty. But it's their choice. Not all Muslim women do that. And so, again, it's their choice. It's a freedom of choice. Islam is not trying to impose anything on you. You're tested by that which you have been guided by. You can accept it or you can reject it, just like the laws of the land, as I tried to mention in the opening statement. You can choose to follow the laws of the land or not. It's up to you, man. But what's going to happen as, as a, uh, um, if you don't? There's going to be consequences for it. And so, you know, from equality, trying to establish the gender equality, um, it's, that's a, a big topic to discuss. It's a lot to go into, so we didn't be able to get, you know, like, I would like to discuss that. But uh, matter of fact, as the, the 14th chapter of my book is, is titled The Rights of Women in Islam. I take that, that particular subject very seriously because of this. It's one of the most attacked areas against Islam. And um, so I wrote a, devoted a whole chapter to that, that subject in particular. And um, I discussed the uh, uh, drug and alcohol use, the rights of uh, equality of, of, for all people, um, mentioning that at, at the masjid, when we go to the mosque and we go to pray, we say, Allahu Akbar. We might have someone from whatever country on this side. From the, the, the place is full. Every masjid that you go to, every house of prayer is filled with people from all, all nations. And when we see one another, we're, we're, we're brothers in faith. I, I forgot to start my time. But I'll just, I'll just close by saying uh, that Islam is the solution. And I encourage you, to, um, you know, to, to seek knowledge about Islam from Islamic sources. Uh, you know, go to the Muslims themselves, go to the Muslims in your community, the, the, the local mosque or the masjid, and talk to the Muslims. Contact me, uh, I'll, whatever question you have, I don't mind asking, you know, answering it. And, uh, and try to stay away from receiving information about Islam from non-Islamic sources. Uh, so I encourage you to be readers instead of repeaters and to accept once again 
Islam for what it is instead of rejecting it for what it is not. So I'll leave you by saying assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so very much, Kenny. And now we're going to hand it over to T-Jump for his up to four minute closing statement. All right, so the topic tonight was what, would, what is the solution to humanity? I made the argument that the solution to humanity is the one that produced the best outcome for living, the best life standards, the best education standards, the best wealth standards, the most food, the most of everything that we measure in quality of life. And Kinney made the argument that alcohol is bad. Um, I don't really see this as a serious argument. I don't really care about alcohol usage. If you do it responsibly, that's a good thing. It improves quality of life. It doesn't diminish it. And so I don't think the fact that people, that a small minority of people have problems with alcohol and drugs outweighs the fact that there are honor killings and people in Sharia law has people having been stoned to death and having their arms cut off and being imprisoned for not believing in the faith. I don't think the small amount of people with alcohol and drug problems even comes close to the negative impacts on society as all the different policies in Sharia law have is in Islamic countries. So if we're asking what is the solution to humanity, um, we should go with the one that improves education, has the highest IQ, by the way, atheists have a six point higher IQ than religious people on average, um, has the highest education level, highest education level actually goes to Jews and then Christians, atheists are third, then Buddhists and then Islam and Hindus are like the half as much as any of the other ones. So I'm going with the ones that have the best impact on society. I think that is the best solution to humanity, which is not Islam, and I will yield my case. Thank you so very much, T. I would like to thank both Kenny and T. Jump for joining us tonight at DebateCon, and we are now going to be moving into the Q&A section. So if you have a question you'd like to ask either or both of our interlocutors, I'd like you to please gather uh, in the center here. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my question uh, for you, you said that uh, Islam, you, you don't take drugs in, in Islam, and it, uh, the drugs in itself is... Um, it's, even louder. Yeah, can, what about now? Can you hear me better? Even louder. Louder. Okay. Hadouken! Exactly. All right, cool. All right, <clears throat> so there are uh, more positive uh, again i agree with t-jump on it there's more positive effects um in regards to drugs than there are negative effects that, that's uh, in regards to let's say uh, military um we literally get our mental uh <laughs> stability beat up on daily um and for years and years and years and when some of us get out um, we have this thing called ptsd <laughs> And uh, they force us to, or they tell us that we need to take a Lexapro and things of this nature. Whereas, uh, scientifically, yes, it may work, but if you actually try to do a more holistic way of taking uh, maybe uh, uh, mushrooms or DMT, that is have been proven to be more beneficial um, than taking Lexapro because if you get off Lexapro, you get zaps. I'm asking you just a so my question is. With the actual uh, uh, evidence that you know shrooms and, and things like that that are actually uh, more better for humans versus uh, you know maybe the word of God, um, do you think that uh, in Islam, right, would that be accepted um, as a part of uh, uh, you know Islam because that actually helps again way more than somebody telling me the word of God. Um, to the, the mental stability of, of, of humanity. So I appreciate your, your question. Uh, and so if I understand you correctly, you know. Uh, that mic's not working. Oh, it's just off. It's off? Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so. You're getting a signal now? Okay. Okay. So I appreciate your, your question and your comments there. And um, so I think, you know, what we need to consider uh, is that. Um, you know, for, for one, our, our God, our creator, is the one who gave us the resources to, to make these medications and so forth for ourselves. And if they're used responsibly, then, you know, that's, that's a blessing from our creator. But in that is the test. 
And so, um, you know, if, if, some, if something is, is, is set in place by society, by a collective agreement in society, that these particular drugs are, are beneficial to help someone. And of course, we know that's the, that's the case. So Islam is not telling you not to use any medication. But, but again, if it's prescribed by a doctor and it's regulated and so forth, but what happens is that people start opening the door a little bit and it gets progressively worse. Because we know that, that you know, sometimes you have to increase your dosage even with the doctor, but you have the doctor regulating it instead of the person that's consuming the, the, the drugs or the alcohol to the point that they just, what they took last, you know, last week or last year or whatever, didn't, it's, you know, it's, it's not the same amount that, you know, they need more now. They need more now. Okay, they need more now. And so they begin to abuse it. And there, there opens the door to the problem. And uh, so we have to, you know, we have to be mindful of that and think about that. So this is for T-Jump. Uh, in the 20th century, for the first time in history, we had widespread atheistic regimes that were responsible for 109 million deaths globally. Um, if atheism is the solution, then why does it seem that it was the greatest historical problem that we ever had um, in the 20th century? Uh, it wasn't atheism. Like if we, if that was, isn't that special pleading? Like you said, that's not Islam. No, because the vast majority, the vast majority of atheists don't do that. They don't avow that. They don't adhere to that. Whereas in Islam, no, the vast majority of the majority of Muslims actually do support Sharia law in countries. Whereas the vast majority of atheists totally condemn Hitler. That was where political ideologies, atheism did not in any way adhere for any of those things. There's no tenets of atheism that actually support those things. Whereas there in Islam, there are specific tenets that interpreted by the vast majority of Muslims, whether can you call them true Muslims or not, they interpret these statements that are literally said by the holy book to do these things. Whereas there's nothing in atheism that supports that. And the, pretty much every atheist country in the world disavows Hitler and Mao and Pol Pot other than like China and Russia. Th those are the only exceptions. So pretty much every atheist country today disavows those things and does everything in the exact opposite way. So that would be ridiculous to equate that to atheism, specifically because there's no holy book in atheism that says, advocates for any of that in any possible interpretation, as opposed to Islam, which literally has the words that can be interpreted to say those things. Okay, I will ask a quick question yeah, before I... I just because we have so many questions, I want to be sure everybody gets at least one in. Okay, go to the second question. three seconds. Uh, I hate to do this, but... Okay, all right, it's fine. Okay, okay. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so... I have a question for Kenny. Okay. Uh, you had said that uh, the abuses of people's rights, said, such as things like women not being able, allowed to drive or having the, the, the forcing the full you know, niqab face covering, those have nothing to do with Islam. Stay closer to the mic. Uh, so, so, okay. so, so my question to you is it seems to me that in countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia, it's religious scholars and religious clerics who know the Islamic sources very well. Uh, that support and enforce these laws. So my question to you would be, if it seems like there are all of these scholars that support these oppressive things, how can you say that that isn't real Islam or yeah. true Islam? Yeah, so, so uh, thank, you. thank you for that question. And that, that's the typical uh, questions that come up uh, on this subject. And we have to realize that culturalism is, is, has tainted the religion in some aspects. And that, um, again, um, you know, if you look at the statistics, you know, 30,000 since 9-11, by example, 30,000 new reverts to Islam each and every year. It's actually increasing. It may be even higher that, than that by now, but, but most of those being women. And so the women who are reverting to Islam, they're, they're studying in Islam, they're, and that you can be assured they're, they're, they're concerned about, am I going to have to cover myself? What's, what, what am I going to have to do? Do I even want to do that? And they come to realize that when you study this properly, that you, you, you don't have to. Now, you're highly encouraged, but in that is the test for the woman, right? And so in those, those countries, those societies, you know, that's part of their culture. That's, that's the expected norm. Uh, and, you know, we shouldn't judge our standards based on what they do in, in their country. That's their country making those, those laws and those rules. And, uh, again, that's not Islam itself saying to do that. Now, they base what they're saying, you know, they, they kind of go overboard with it in, in, in a sense in that. But Allah says in the Quran just that, do not, do not go to extremes in your religion. Do 
to not do things that outside of the outside of the, the rules here the, or what the guidance. And so sometimes the culturalism does, uh, you know, uh, kind of domineer uh, in some in some societies, some situations. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to eliminate the the um, in those instances they're trying to eliminate. Uh, you know, divorce rates and adultery and sex, you know, sex outside of marriage and children being born, you know, with only one parent and so forth. And so, uh, you know, it, again, it's, it's not relig- the religion itself that's telling them to making them do this. It is their choice. And that is the test. Uh, you'll see Muslim women in summary, you'll see Muslim women um, often that they're Muslim women, but they, they, don't, they don't cover themselves. They carry themselves modestly, but they don't necessarily have the hijab on. Okay. Hello, this uh, question's for T-Jump. Um, as an atheist myself, I'm curious to know how you derived objective morality from atheism. Uh, thank you. So I derive objective morality by looking at the evidence. So in philosophy, the evidence of morality comes to us from moral intuitions and moral progress. Uh, if we look at the pattern of the way morality has changed over time, it seems to be a very clear, consistent pattern from women's rights to LGBT rights to voters' rights to workers' rights, animals' rights. It seems that as the scope of our intellect and our and our resources improves, that the scope of morality also seems to increase with that. And if we plot this out on a graph, it seems like morality is following a very specific pattern. So uh, in the same way that Newton discovered um, gravity, it was called his, his model, he, he used this term, hypothesis non fingo. So he didn't actually say what gravity was. He had no idea. All he did was he said, here is this very clear pattern that we see. Here is a principle that we can use to describe it, which is his mathematical principles. And I'm just doing the same thing with morality, like most moral philosophers. We see a pattern in morality, and we make principles to describe it, and then try to infer what it could be from that, which I think it's more something like an undiscovered law of nature or something like that. Um, but there are many hypotheses, like it's a higher order emergent property, a platonic object, a, a priori abstract. There's lots of different various models of what morality could be. It's just, we don't know. Hypothesis non fingal. All we know is there's this very clear pattern that we see. I guess, why should we objectively value that progress? Or maybe I shouldn't. Sorry. I've got to stop. Thank you, though. Hi. Thank you very much for your kind words. I really like your kindness and the way you express yourself. Thank you. Thank I really you. like it. So I have a question that's a little bit personal for you, but it, oh. for me in the way it also you said in, in your opening statement that Islam tells you to be good. In the closing statement, you said that you have to follow Islam. But you have to follow Islam, f- sorry, but you have to follow Muhammad's example. From what I've heard, he killed and tortured people, owned and trade slaves, pillaged, had sex slaves, slept with underage girls. He did everything that we would say in this time that a bad, por- the, a bad person will do. And from that one, he was a normal warlord of his time. And I see no change in him, in, in goodness on him, that I, I, he would made, I would make him a model of my life. So my question for you is, why do you, uh, why do you choose him as a model of your life? Okay. Because you do not seem to be like him. You are, you are much, much more kinder person than he seems okay. to be. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Thank you for thank you for the the, uh, the question. And um, by no means uh, do I think that I'm anywhere close to the character of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him. Because uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala Himself, our God, our Creator Himself, said that He sent Him as a mercy to all of mankind. He is the best example of of what a human should be. I encourage you to watch my debate uh, later this evening with David Wood on the topic of the marriage that you mentioned to Aisha Radiallahu Anha. Um, so Malcolm X, there's a quote by Malcolm X that I mentioned in my book that he says that the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent, and that's power because they control the minds of the masses. Another quote by Malcolm X says that if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people that are being oppressed and loving the people that are doing the oppressing. And so the common narrative in, uh, in the world of Islamophobia uh, is that you know, it's all, it's all negative images about Muslims. And by attacking the credibility of the Prophet himself, they're inevitably attacking all Muslims. And, um, and so, you know, I would encourage you. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, when, when I said it earlier, and I've said it a couple of times today, to be readers instead of repeaters. Because what I, when I hear you say this, no offense to you, but these things that you're mentioning, these are the same common things that we hear all the time. Because the propaganda used against Islam is so prominent, that's why I wrote that book back there. 
And it's so prominent in, in closing. It's so prominent that people begin to believe it while they, they're just, they're, because they've heard it so often. And you just begin to believe it. So my, I encourage you to seek knowledge from true Muslims and to get your, your knowledge from Muslims. And you'll stay, if you study the life of the, the prophet in closing and the uh, uh, unbiased historians and, and scholars that have studied his life, you'll see that their narrative is totally different than the one from the Islamophobe side. Thank and, you. Okay? Thank you. Questions for Kenny? Sure. Hey, Kenny, I heard you mention during... I heard you mention during your opening statement that Islam guarantees success to the individual in life and in the hereafter. Would you please define for me uh, success and how can you substantiate such claim? Okay, great. I'm glad you, that's a great question. So the call to prayer itself, when, when the, the, the Adan is called, you know, the, what's being said is, is that God is great, God is great, Allah is great, and Allah is the greatest. To come to prayer, come to prayer, come to your success come to your success. Because what you find is that, you know, the, the continuous return to prayer five times a day, I'm not, I don't know if you believe in a creator or not, but the continuous return to prayer gives us the opportunity to seek forgiveness for the things that we've done wrong in this world. It gives us the opportunity to thank our God, our creator, for blessings that he's bestowed upon us. It gives us the opportunity to say, God, help me. You know, I don't know what to do about this. In my personal prayer, I always say every prayer, Oh, Allah, you're my comfort, my peace, my protector. I can't make it without you. Because I've tried. I've tried to live my life and, you know, uh, yeah, I've had success in this. I used to be in the music business, signed a couple of record deals and so forth. But, you know, I realized that inevitably all that's, all that's for naught. When I've devoted my time and my life to my creator and, you know, and that continuous return, it makes me more conscious about everything I say and I do makes me a better person. This, I'm not just speaking for myself. This is the Muslim standpoint that Islam reconditions the individual. Makes you, if you were a drug addict or you was a, a, you know, a, you know, running around with different people and having sex with the people all over the place, it makes you run away from those things. It reconditions you and remolds you and reshapes you. And uh, it's all established by the prayer. Allah says in the Quran in summary, to seek help through patience and prayer. The continuous return, the continuous return. Come to success. Come to success. You can't once you you get up off out of the prayer. You feel that you your your burdens in life have been re, been removed every single time. Every single time. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so this question is for Kenny. Sure. Um, so uh, you uh, consistently throughout your your statements quoted Surah Al Baqarah. Uh, Ayah 256, where it says, let there be no compulsion in religion, for the truth stands out clearly from falsehood. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, is that uh, you say to be a reader and not a repeater. Well, the Quran also says, I'm not sure the surah or ayah, it says to, that if you are in doubt, seek those who have knowledge. True. Well, I think that when it comes to Islam, those who have knowledge would be the Sahaba and those who compile their words, would it not? Well, sure, they're going to yeah. be the ones closest to the, to the right. Prophet, peace be upon them. So, um, in Asbab al-Nazul by al-Wahidi, who was considered one of the greatest Quran commentators of his time, he said um, that uh, it was reported by, he said it was reported by al-Sudi um, that, here it is, that the verse, uh, let there be no compulsion in religion, was, uh, was called down because there was a traitor uh, from Medina who had two sons who accepted Christianity. They were brought to the Prophet Muhammad, and Muhammad uh, uh, and Allah allegedly then revealed this verse, let there be no compulsion in religion. Uh, it says, it says, uh, yes, no problem. Um, it says that uh, this was before the messenger of Allah was commanded to fight the people of the book. It says, but then Allah's saying there is no compulsion of religion was abrogated, replaced, and the prophet was commanded to fight the people of the book in Surah at tawbah in verse 29, ayah 29, where it says, fight those who do not believe in God in the last day, nor comply with God and his messenger have forbidden, nor embrace the religion of truth from among those who are given the scriptures until they pay the jizya, the tax, willingly and fullingly submitted. Yeah. Um, and so I was just wondering, why are you consistently quoting an abrogated verse okay. your, uh, it's, it's, in, in your... It, your it's your not verse. abrogated. You, so I don't know who that person was that made that, gave that opinion, but so... You're talking about two different situations here. For one, um, 
if you notice what the verse says, it says to fight those who, do, who reject the law in summary, those who are, are fighting against you, those who are rejecting, and, and force them to pay the, the jizya. So that situation is one in, uh, in which the Muslims were actually uh, living amongst, living with the Christians, and they, they were in a situation where they were uh, in a war situation. Just like we in this, in this country, uh, we have to pay taxes. And part of our taxes go to our military defense. And if we don't pay the, 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 the tax, you know, for, for everything, but part of it goes to our military defense. So if we don't pay the tax, then we are, uh, um, we, we have brought a, a um, you know, it's detrimental to ourselves. You, you've, you've brought shame against yourself because you had the ability to either go and, f and join the fight to defend the, the nation or you have chosen not to fight, and you just you, you don't you just want to be a, you don't want to be a part of it. But that same nation is is taking care of you. So in that situation that you mentioned, that other verse, the Muslims were actually uh, in control at that time. And when they took over Mecca, when they returned out there after the after the Hijra, they had to leave to Medina. When they come back, they come back ten thousand strong. They didn't kill anyone. All the people who were previously torturing them and doing all kind of wrong to them, they didn't harm a soul. And now they're, now they're in control, and the Christians are living among them. Some of the Christians had to pay uh, the, the jizya, the mean, meaning the tax. It's nothing more than the tax that we would pay here in the United States. It's similar to that. And, you know, so if you don't want to pay it, then it's, it's putting, a, putting, a, putting pressure on them to say, hey, are you at least going to help us? If you're a man and you're, one of the, you're part of this community, are you willing to come and fight? If you're not willing to fight, are you willing to at least spend of your resources so that we can arm our defenses? Because we're inevitably, we're defending you as well. So, okay. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but, you know, so that's, there's two, two, two different things going on there, so. His question's for Kenny. Sure. Um, uh, T. Jump brought up an article or a website saying that uh, the statistics show that it's better in secular locations like crime and uh, poverty. Uh, I just want to know, asking you personally, uh, what do you think the agenda of these of the guys who wrote these articles? Because you talk about Islamophobia, do you believe the men who made these articles, speaking of Christianity, had an agenda? And if they had an agenda, what do you believe it was? Well, so we know that the, the Islamophobia is real, and it's it's uh, something that um, that we have to consider whenever we hear something about any source from any source. We need to to be uh, uh, wise enough to say, well, let me check into that. You just, you shouldn't just believe anything you say. You, you hear someone say, uh, you should go and check the source, uh, see who you know what if you can to the best of your ability, find out what these people are are all about and uh, so I don't know what sources he, he was using I don't think he mentioned but um, but the, the fact of the matter is this Islamophobia is prominent it is real and uh, there's a we discussed Hitler today let me let me just mention a quote by Hitler I mentioned in the book as well and it says the purpose of propaganda is not to provide interesting distraction for blase young gentlemen but to convince the masses but the masses are slow moving and they always require a certain time before they are ready to even notice a thing, and only after the simplest ideas are repeated thousands of times will the masses finally remember them, right? And another quote by one of his henchmen, the, uh, Paul Joseph Goebbels, the chancellor of, of Nazi Germany, he says, the propaganda works best when the people being manipulated are confident that they're acting on their own free will. And so in summary, these tactics that, that are used, they're well studied. Um, we hear these little sound bites, 10 second sound bites over and over again, radical Islam, Sharia, Sharia law, you know, women are oppressed. We see over and over and over again, people begin to believe those things. Um, it's far from the truth. I encourage you to I gift you a book, as a matter of fact, for free if you like. Um, and that's, that's what I'm addressing in the entire book, just proving the patriots of propaganda. Um, and uh, yeah, so Thank yeah, you. we can't so believe everything that we hear.